This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today, I want to talk about spooky, scary op returns. And this video is a follow-up to yesterday's video, which I think was one of the most important videos that I've ever made, in which I talk about what an emergency soft fork would look like in terms of dealing with these large op returns. If a large CSAM op return ends up in a block at the tip of the chain, at the tip of the blockchain, mining pools under bit 444 will start to mine on the penultimate block in the chain. In an attempt to reorg out the offending block. At the same time, a series of filters that will prevent future large op returns and inscriptions will be rolled out and enforced at the consensus level by nodes going forward so that another reorg is not necessary for the next large CSAM op return simply because these will no longer be allowed inside of blocks. This is what the Bitcoin blockchain looks like. And so if we were going to get a if we were to get a large CSAM op return in this at the tip of the chain here, miners could start to try to reorg that block out by mining instead on top of this block. And this would create a chain split, a temporary chain split, but I think it would be the non-CSAM chain that would ultimately be chosen and that would win. There was a lot of pushback from this. I wanted to address some of it. Platinum Thunder Studios writes here, first a reorg for CSAM, then a reorg for terrorism, then a reorg for money laundering, obviously citing a sort of slippery, slippery slope here. My response, nope, one is an actual legal file. That would be the CSAM one. The others are just records of monetary transactions. Do you see the difference? It doesn't really matter to me if they're records of historical monetary transactions that took place that maybe involved bad things on the Bitcoin blockchain. That's just part of what money is. And Lysel responds here, what is illegal? What is monetary? Uh, the only filter should be fees and the data limit can be reduced. My response, you can play the game of linguistic nihilism, but everyone knows that CSAM is highly illegal and morally abhorrent. Adam White had a similar critique in case illegal data appears on chain. Matthew, you know that certain financial transactions, for example, an individual under sanctions are by definition illegal data. You can say, oh, that's not the intent of bit 444, yet that's exactly what it says in plain English. It does actually not say that in plain English if you go back and read the bit. Uh, Adam goes on though to say, what happened to freedom money, immutable and uncensorable? My response is similar to what we've been saying here. I'm happy to store a record of monetary transactions even if some of those transactions are between really bad people, I'm not happy to store and distribute illegal, illicit images. Freedom money, not freedom, arbitrary data storage. Then Adam responds, Matthew, you're not responding to what I said. Bad is subjective, illegal is not. Bit444 explicitly says it will be used to remove illegal data, which necessarily includes illegal financial transactions. If you support Bit444, you are supporting censorship of financial transactions. Don't obfuscate. And my response, feel free to quote the language from the BIP that says that. And this is very important. We're filtering based on format. We're not filtering based on content. This is not going after financial or monetary transactions. This is going after large blobs of arbitrary data. And if we take a look at the BIP, we can see right here, these are the formats that are being forbidden or banned at the consensus level. This has nothing to do with financial content or monetary transactions. These are closing holes in the code that allow people to store large blobs of data that can really get us in a lot of trouble. Images like this, for example, which is fairly tame. This is a large op return. You can imagine if it were more offensive, for example, let's say this involves some religious figure, or let's say this was pornographic or illegal or something like that. I have really no reason as a node runner to store this sort of garbage on my node. Whereas if we look at the blockchain here, let's just pretend that uh, we have a transaction here on the left. This is the CIA sending money to Al-Qaeda, sending 10 Bitcoin to Al-Qaeda. I have no problem with storing a record of this transaction, even if I don't approve of it, even if I don't like the CIA and I don't like Al-Qaeda either. This is a monetary transaction, and I actually have no idea if this is the CIA or Al-Qaeda. But this is how money needs to work. You need to store historical financial transactions. That's very very, very different from having to store a transaction like this, which is non-monetary. And I don't understand why people have so much trouble understanding this. Again, I have no problem with storing pseudonymous historical transaction, monetary records, monetary transactions on my node, because I understand that I need to store your monetary transactions, and then you need to store my monetary transactions if Bitcoin's going to be this global transparent ledger that both good people and bad people can use. And we don't legislate based on whether they're good or bad based on the kind of transactions they're making. If they're buying weed or they're buying low-fat yogurt or whatever it is, 
is they're buying, they're buying fake meat. We don't judge people in this way. We let them transact using Bitcoin however they want. But when it starts to involve large blobs of arbitrary data, this is the problem. And it's quite different to be storing historical records of monetary transactions versus storing an illicit illegal image on your node. And any judge or criminal lawyer knows the difference and can explain this to you if you still are having trouble. Valentino Z writes here, the problem is you believing that Bitcoin can be destroyed with any type of arrow. If you really believe a single CSAM image can destroy Bitcoin, then you shouldn't believe in Bitcoin. Hint, hint, Bitcoin already has illegal images on it. Contiguous has no bearing whether these whether this data is all in a row. Beauty on response, contiguity does have a bearing on this, and you would know that if you knew anything about the subject. It has already been found in law that non-contiguous files give server owners immunity. You asserting something doesn't make it true. Valent Valentino Z responds, but these are contiguous obfuscated files. The work needed to unobfuscate them is equal to the work needed to make the non-contiguous data contiguous, so they are equivalent. Luke responds, they're not obfuscated at all. Valentino Z, uh, Valentino Z says that data is XOR. This is like a weak encryption of blocks uh, in your node, but you actually have the key right there. So it's a, it's kind of a fake form of encryption. The data is XOR with a key when it is stored. When you consider that obfuscation, Luke responds, no, that's no difference, no different from the AES your hard drive does internally, where it basically stores stuff on your hard drive in a weakly encrypted way. Valentino Z responds, well, yes, but I simply mean to point out that contiguous data isn't just lying there bare on your drive. It's XORed and thus obfuscated in the sense that it's not obviously readable. Luke responds, a single HTTP request to your node gets a JPEG. This is the real problem. And if you try to explain this to a criminal lawyer or a judge and say, oh, I was just storing these illegal images on my hard drive, but they're encrypted by AES, so I shouldn't get in trouble. I don't think you're gonna do very well in court. Valentino Z, the response I thought from uh, Nick Zabo was even better and more, more uh, compact. Bitcoin is not some magic spell, you effing idiot. Bitcoin is only free of security holes if the programmers remove the security holes. I love how Nick just cuts through everything, and gets right to the heart of the matter. There's another discussion here I wanted to, to uh, enter. Melvin Carvalho writing, Core version 30 expanded plain text relay by 1250 times. As Nick Zabo points out, that widens the legal attack surface. If illicit data lands on chain, nodes and custodians face seizure slash takedown risk. In the worst case, coins can be seized as evidence. Matt Corallo responds, no, it doesn't. Inscriptions were already a thing. Melvin responds, true. Inscriptions existed, but core version 30 expanded the default relay path. We're talking about un unconfirmed transactions here being sent from node to node. Core version 30 expanded the default relay path for raw plain text by 12 150 percent or 1250 times that normalizes it as intended use rather than tolerated abuse which materially increases legal exposure for node operators and custodians this tolerated abuse would be inscriptions where it's sort of a hack whereas rolling out the red carpet to arbitrary data as bitcoin core is now done this really matters and intent matters matt corallo writes no it doesn't whether the bytes are touching or not is irrelevant Melvin responds, agreed, the bytes don't change. As Nick Zabo notes, what changed is policy signaling, policy signaling from the reference implementation. Version 30 expanded default relay by 1250 times, shifting from quote unquote discouraged data abuse to quote unquote officially supported use. That matters legally, even if the bytes look the same. So there are many different ways to approach this. What remains clear is that we currently have a crisis in Bitcoin. And as Renault points out here with some very good data, 37% of Bitcoin block space is now non-financial data. That's about a half or 0.6 megabytes per block. The transaction fees that spammers pay are very low for getting their files stored forever on someone else's computer. They're essentially free riding on a $2 trillion network built and secured for payments. I would add monetary payments. And version 30 was just released. This gets worse. And some are still wondering why a soft fork is now on the table. So I'll put a link to this. You can check out the data and see what sort of non-monetary data is filling up the chain. Before we end, I wanted to wish all of you a happy Bitcoin white paper day. It was on this day, October 31st, 2008, that Satoshi Nakamoto first published the Bitcoin white paper and basically launched the revolution with that white paper. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.